printing money is bad, mm-hmm. right? It's inflationary. Mm-hmm. Uh, but borrowing printed money is insane. <laughs> I mean, it was all the way back in the primaries where I drew the parallel. It, it amazes me. Uh, and, of course, that is why I knew. So we talked about what they were in possession of back then. What's in possession now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now we've removed the gold and silver from our money. So there's no pile of gold that they have to put anything on, you see. They're borrowing from a pile that they create. So the well, the actual Who's the they, here? they here, the actual wellspring of money, is the Federal Reserve banks. So the Federal Reserve banks are actually monetize the notes that the uh, Bureau of Engraving and Printing, which is a Treasury Department, they print hundred dollar bills, cost them about two and a half cents. They sell them to the Federal Reserve at two and a half cents, or the cost to manufacture. I think it's two point eight now. And then the Federal Reserve exchanges them for whatever they want. So now I'm going to give you the power to create money, and and you're the guy who puts it into circulation. And you put it into circulation by buying things. So then I'm going to ask you, what are you going to buy, Patrick? I'm going to buy a new car. Oh, yeah? Just a new car? Not a car factory? <laughs> You're okay, not going to buy, 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 buy everything? How about everything? I'll buy everything. How about you just buy everything? Yeah. yeah. And so from 1913, when the Fed was given this power, of course, the, the reins, the controls that we put on them was, okay, look, we're going to give you all of the gold. You're going to issue the notes against the gold. And that way we know only one person is doing it, and they're not going to issue more notes than they have gold. That was the idea of in the Federal Reserve Act. That's right. We'll have a uniform currency because, you know, Jackson said anyone can start a bank. Anyone can do it. Anyone can issue bank notes. So I did. You did. Everybody did. Anybody with uh, uh, weight in a community, you know, if you're the top guy in in, in your community, Mr. Potter. <laughs> Mr. You're, Potter, you're, yeah. You're the Mr. Potter of your community. You're going to start a bank, and you're going to put your money in the bank. You're going to issue your bank notes, and maybe you're going to put your picture or your mom's picture on there. Yeah. And everybody else is going to do the same thing. So you had hundreds of different types of currencies, and you had banknote reporter, Grant's banknote reporter, would tell you this is a good note, this is a bad note. And we've discussed this on prior shows, you know, a counterfeit note – from a good bank was better than a real note from a bad bank. It was a strange system of money. And people did not have faith in paper. They, As soon as they got a piece of paper, a paper note, uh, they would quickly convert it into gold. And now if I'm New York City and I've got notes from Kentucky, I have to go find a bond broker or a bill broker like Goldman Sachs. And I have to say to the Goldmans, hey, here's my notes from this wildcat bank down in Kentucky, and I'd like to turn them into current money that's good here in New York. And they say, okay, well, we'll do it at a discount rate of 5%. And so they would give you 95 cents on the dollar and dispatch their fastest riders to Kentucky to cash those notes in. So it was a it was a curious system, and the proposal was we'll have a single bank with a uniform currency throughout the country, and this bank will be federal, and they'll issue the the notes, and they'll keep the gold, and you know since they're federal that they're going to be honest about it, and so they did, and they were, and from 1913 until like the early mid 20s, you could take a Federal Reserve note into any bank in the country lay it on the counter and say, I'd like to convert this into lawful money. Give me my gold. And they would quickly slide that gold across the counter. Really? And you'd realize, wow, what a great system we have here. But unbeknownst to everyone, the Federal Reserve was issuing far more notes than they had gold and silver to back it up. Now, this was good for the economy. It gave us the roaring 20s. Boy, did they roar. You know, land uh, speculation in Florida, every ah, industry you can imagine. Building back, bathtub gin things. Sure, there was speculation restaurants. in so every at, arena. at the time, let me interrupt for a minute. Mm-hmm. At the time, did the people doing the gin bathtub, doing the drinking and dancing, having a good time, did they know that these were uh, notes without gold backing? No, they did not. If they did, they would have gone crazy. They would have ah. most certainly taken their notes into the bank and said, you know, give me. But here's what happened, is that the people in the know did know. 
Then starting around 1925, yeah. as fast as the mint struck a $20 gold piece, they would put them in a bag, exchange them for a $20 bill, and send them to Switzerland. And those are the St. Gaudens that your company sells today. By the thousands. Because Amazing. they're available by the thousands because they sat in Switzerland for 50 years. So the, so the boys knew, unbeknownst to the people drinking bathtub gin, that these notes were fiat. Correct. And, and not, so when they did do a $20 uh, gold piece like a St. Gaudens, right. which you sell lots of, sure. Um, they grabbed them they and did. they put them in a bank in Switzerland because they yeah. kn- why'd they put them over there? Well, because they were they worried that they were going to get caught. You know, there was no sure. guarantee that when the hammer came down that Franklin Roosevelt could have just as easily said, you know what, you guys. Bring those gold. Yeah, yeah you did what <laughs> we told you not to That's do. That's fascinating. And so now we're going to put you in jail. So they sent them overseas so they could sit down on a piece of paper and say, I don't have any? Or? Right. Exactly. Kind of, sort of. Exactly. <laughs> kind of, sort of. But like, Roosevelt, wait a minute, I don't recall. I don't recall. <laughs> I don't recall. I don't recall. Roosevelt did the opposite, though. Hmm. He legalized their theft. Oh, he said, he did. you know what, Americans, the Federal Reserve Banks have issued far more notes than they have gold and silver to back it up. They hmm. need your help. There's a frown face after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the little frown, yeah, it is little frown, frown emoticon, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and he said, uh, we need your gold to back it up. So under this executive order, oh, that's how you bring in the gold. every American who's holding any gold bullion of any sort must turn it over to the Federal Reserve in exchange for these unbacked notes. Oh, so that, that was, I see, that's the first time I've really got that. That was the ploy why they did call in the gold, because they had all these notes running around that weren't backed. Correct. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Okay. I didn't, I didn't get that connection before. So President Roosevelt... Of course, they exempted my things, the numismatic coins, coins of rare and coins. unusual yeah. collector value mm-hmm. were exempted. But if you had Krugerrands of the day, a maple leaf, or just a one ounce or 10 ounce or kilo, bar, brick, block, circle, whatever it was, if it wasn't an American collectible coin, it was subject to confiscation and recall. And I say confiscation because they didn't, they didn't really take it from you. They gave you your $20 for every ounce that you gave them. Right, twenty dollars in bills. Oh, of course. Wow, twenty dollars in bills. And they gave it to you and said, "Here." And now, just before that, of course, you saw the "It's a Wonderful Life" analogy. Mm-hmm. It was, oh my gosh, there aren't enough notes to pay all. Uh, there aren't enough uh, gold coins and silver coins to pay all the notes. What are we going to do? And bank after bank after bank was insolvent. They didn't have the coins. They had all these deposits. They couldn't get, uh, pay out gold or silver coin. So President Roosevelt, on a Friday afternoon, closed the banks. He closed them. Is That's it. The banks are closed. And they can't reopen unless they um, can prove their financial stability. So Americans, by and large, were cut off from their money. Their banks, they couldn't go to the bank, couldn't get their money, couldn't do anything. No one would take any IOUs or notes because, obviously... They didn't know what was going to happen the next day. And it was in this environment, with the banks all closed, that Franklin issued his executive order that said, you have to turn over your gold so that we can restart the system. Wow. And of course, everyone said- Kind of like a false flag thing. Yeah, I want my money back. And the only way I can get my money is to give up my gold? Okay. I'll give up my gold. But wouldn't most people at that time, Andrew Goss, would have had the gold in Gaudens and other just real American money rather than- why would they be hoarding bricks? I mean, I don't understand. And they didn't have to bring, they didn't have to give those in. Well, they Wouldn't didn't. Wouldn't most of the gold have been in the did. real money? They didn't, but they did. <laughs> what do you mean? They didn't in the sense that um, the law didn't require them to turn over anything that was collectible or legal tender. Or just or real money. money. Huh. Right. They, the law didn't require Just that. like a, a year old uh, coin. But they did it anyway. Oh, they, why? They, well, because they're Duh. patriotic Americans. They oh. want to restart the system. So they brought in all their gold coin and all their gold bricks and every, you know, all the bullion gold. They brought it all in. Brought it all in under penalty of law Mm. and said, uh, you know, here's my gold. Give me my notes. And so they reliquified the system and immediately uh, Franklin Roosevelt set the price of gold at $35 an ounce. Good for Franklin. So they bought it from the American public at 20 and then they reliquified at 35 and in the process made $15 off every ounce of gold that they had. And so all of that money 
was put into an exchange stabilization fund oh, and was the, left at the yeah. discretion of the president. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that still exists today. Yeah, still exists. Yes, Exchange it does. stabilization fund. Uh huh. ESF, and and so now the the president had the authority to use this extra money that wasn't treasury money, right? It was stolen money. <laughs> he 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 had the authority to use this money off the books of Congress. Wow. And what do you know, do with that? Well, exchange stabilization. So when people said, "Oh, well, now the dollar's unbacked, and we're going to rate it, we're going to go short." Well, he would get out there and use the exchange stabilization fund to thwart these efforts through his secretary, the Treasury, uh, Morgenthau. Just like it's done today. Just like it's done so, today. So- 